Which one? The strip um, that's right behind you. That one there? Yeah. Those are Tad Dorgans. Oh, my God. You have Tad Dorgans? Yeah. You know, the, I, I have this little goal to have, like, something of every one of George Harriman's friends. <laughs> I don't actually collect, but I wanted that. So um, let's see. So this is, and this is a cool one because it's got, uh, you can quite see it. It's a little homage to Harriman because he has, it's a little, it's a cartoonist trying to get his uh, work accepted. And yeah. in the background, there's a little picture of George Harriman, a little picture of a black <laughs> back wall. So it's just, it's just delightful and lovely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Little, and, you know, Tad looking down your, uh, your shoulder as you work is kind of a reminder to, uh, what's, th there's a phrase that said that if Tad would have had a sign up on his desk, it would have said, don't kid yourself. Tad, I, this is the only Tad comic I have. Which yeah, Tappy Dills. Yeah. And that's just all like stick figure comics inside and stuff. The the indoor is called indoor sports and outdoor sports, and they are um, they sort of became like the Jimmy Hatlow. They'll do it every time. Like that really is kind of modeled on on Tad. So it's a lot of the I, which is what I love. That's my favorite work of Tad's is these things, and it's just basically a little scene of uh, in the office or in somebody's parlor, and it's just people bullshitting each other. And there's always you know some little gang of people laughing at the at the ridiculousness that someone else is being. It's it's very very acerbic uh, stuff. Like uh, um, sort of like, what was that called? Our boarding house? Yeah, exactly. It's Definitely in that, in that vein. Real kind of little vignettes. Um, he did like a comic called Judge Rummy. Do you remember that? that was yeah. Like, I mean, you could, maybe you could collect those. I don't know. It's You know, it often, like I've had people often say, oh, you got to do a Tad Dorgan book. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to sell even less than <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah. But, Right. But he is amazing. Um, uh, the probably the most you're ever going to see is in Eddie Campbell's book, The Goat Getters. Um, he did a whole lot on Tad in that book. Um, yeah. And and that's probably the most you're ever going to really see. But I I mean I agree. I think some of the stuff you have to have lots of footnotes. You know, mm -hmm. this prize fighter. You know, lost to this prize fighter, and that's what he's doing here. Yeah. But some yeah, of the stuff yeah, is just yeah. is completely transferable. Like hypocrisy. Hypocrisy translates over over a century. <laughs> oh, I, I would love to see that. And I didn't know until actually I read Crazy that Tad Dorgan was missing the hands on it or the fingers on his right hand. Yeah. They had blown him off or something. Or It was a, a, I think a house was being moved, if I remember correctly. And he was a little kid playing around and got his fingers under something. And there were multiple lawsuits. I actually found little items in the news about these lawsuits that were, uh, that were settled uh, over this. But he had a nub of a hand, I think he said. And yeah, that, he'd be a prize fighter, and that's why he never didn't become a prize fighter. Oh. Cartooning instead. Well, they never. I couldn't find a photo of his. Like it seemed like whenever there was a photo of him, he like had his hands behind his, behind his back or yeah. in his pockets or something. Like right. Like, yeah, that's so funny because like he he looks emaciated. Like the photos of him, he looks very like like his face. He has such a crazy yeah like his Ichabod Crane. Yeah, yeah, he's very Ichabod Craneish. Very, very you know the. the you know, I think there's there's an ad somewhere, and it's you know this man makes everyone laugh in the picture. Yes, <laughs> yes I, I want that. I actually want that page framed. It's uh -huh. just so funny, like. And he was he was Harriman's guy, you know. I mean, I think he really was Harriman's uh, idol, and I think he probably helped out Harriman a couple times uh, yeah. when Harriman was in his 30s, bouncing around a little bit and losing jobs. I, I got the feeling that Tad, who was a huge star, uh, you know, in fact. There's one um, uh, uh, letter that uh, who was he was sort of the hatchet man for the Hearst Art Department um, block. I think his name was right. I'm thinking Rock Rudolph. Anyway, uh, he's actually telling uh, Harriman, why should we run your cartoons? We got Tad Dorgan. We have the real thing. Yeah, it's like a, there's like a list of I saw of uh, all the slang words that he like kind of introduced into the the lexicon of yeah. <laughs> America. <Yeah. laughs> Either popularized or credited with, or yeah, that 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 could be some serious project to actually dig that stuff up and and really see which ones he did and where they where they turned up. I think um somebody has the yes we have no bananas. A friend of mine in D.C. has the original yes we have no bananas strip. Oh wow! Uh, that yeah. Tad did that predated the song. See, uh, you have the power to uh, go to Fanographics or something and say. I want to put together a book of Tad Dorgan's comic strips. Uh, I'll write the introduction to it and uh, the afterword. 
you have the power. You can do that if you want it. No, I mean, Crazy Cat dailies are still buried. It's yeah, the, da- the dailies are very personal uh, to Harriman, I think. When I read the dailies, um, there's a lot more commentary on race and identity, or maybe not more commentary, but it's just right in your face in the dailies. Uh, very stark sometimes, you know, like there's that one daily where Crazy Cat is crying and um, and Pup goes, you know, what are you crying? And Ignatz called me a bad word, Crazy says. And and Pup goes to Ignatz and says, what'd you call him? And comes back and says, I just called him an enigma. So what, what Crazy heard uh, is really uh, kind of incredible. Uh, and I can't believe they made that joke in the newspaper. It's a yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing. It's like like Harriman himself. The the, the content was hiding in plain view. You yeah, know, it's it's so evident. These jokes about Crazy's tail being crooked mm-hmm. or kinky, mm-hmm. um, and and the 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 comparison with Harriman's own hair uh, as being kind of a telltale sign is so obvious. Crazy yeah. says, "Oh, it's I just had it marcelled." You know, he he actually describes the tail as hair even. Um, so but, you- you read these the daily strips? Yeah, yeah, I read, I read, I read them all. How did you do it? <laughs> Thanks to our friends at Fanographics, they they helped provide me the uh, the, the effect. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, it all goes back. Yes, they they very kindly, uh, very kindly. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Kim very kindly uh, gave them to me for research purposes and and. Uh, so, so they are there. They're kind of a little bit of a mess because um, sometimes some were reprinted. I don't, I don't think anyone's ever really gone day by day and figured out which ones were reprints from which periods of time. You know, when Harriman was sick, especially in the 30s, a few times they ran reprints. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think one challenge they have is the last few years of the dailies. Um, I love. They're amazing. It's like hieroglyphic information. You know, they're so... Mm-hmm. The lines are so spare and mm. the the joke or the gag is so uh, delicate as, as to almost not be visible. Um, and, uh, you know, and Ignat sometimes is just, you know, almost two dots, you know, in an oval or something like that, as Harriman had arthritis and other ailments. And and so I think I think they see probably rightly, even if people wanted to buy because they did put out those panoramic dailies like the most sort of obviously glorious ones uh, in a separate book and people i think well and also the earliest ones um are very different well anyway what, what i'm saying is is i think if you get to the late teens and 20s and 30s that kind of looks like what we think crazy cat would be and i think people would want to buy those and read them and enjoy them that's where the tiger t series is yeah, that's where yeah. the others are the first couple of years are minstrel shows put in comic form I mean, they're really crazy kind of Ignatz talking and and Ignatz, you know, is asking crazy a question and crazy says something stupid and Ignatz throws a brick and it's just straight out of minstrel show uh, humor. And in fact, sometimes they literally have language from minstrel shows like end men and bones and, you know, and these characters are referenced in the strip. And then, you know, much later on, does does crazy cat start to fall in love with Ignatz and all the all the things that, that, that we sort of associate. So for us, it's wonderful for me and you and, you know, big fans to see the evolution of the character of Crazy Cat through going through vaudeville and minstrel shows yeah, into yeah. Coconino County and becoming this chaplain-esque, uh, you know, character that Crazy becomes. But, you know, I wonder if people really want to buy books of the 1914 and 15 strips. Um, so last I, I don't, this this might be confidential, but last last time we talked about it, uh, they were even thinking about doing it as um, what's that word in publishing? Like just a big ass, expensive, beautiful volume of something. Like prestigious. prestigious. Yeah, yeah, but basically like all the dailies, you know, as one big beautiful brick shaped thing with lots of essays and extras and that kind of thing. You know, really for the people who really really want it. Um, yeah. So, and, and you know the reviewers to glom onto and and me like I that's the best thing about being a fan of graphics artist is you can just write to them and be like can I have a copy of that and then <laughs> it's also the best thing about being a fan of graphics essayist as well oh yeah that's right oh yeah my first Jeez. essay I did for them I just got paid in in the collected peanuts I'm looking at a uh, I, I 
I said I don't collect originals, and now you keep talking about originals. I do have a Gasoline Alley. That, uh, it's, um, it's one where they go to Louisiana, uh, where Skizix and Walt are going on their trip around the country, and they stop in Louisiana and look at the Louisiana State Capitol. Damn, I remember that. You have that? Yeah, yeah. And it's just, uh, it's, it's just six months after the Capitol was, I'm looking at it right now, right after the Capitol. Oh, hold on. So, oh, yeah. It's this beautiful stuff. So they're looking at it and he's showing things around. And he said, I want to go shopping. He said, no, no, you got to look at these things. So he's giving little lectures about, uh, about the buildings. And they look at the Capitol, the, you know, Huey Long's Capitol. And it's that great little thing where Skizik says, I'd like them more if I didn't have to look at them. You know, you know I have in my flat files the, uh, all the Sundays of Gasoline Alley from um, the, the 40s and 50s. Uh, mm -hmm. just the tear sheets so it's like the bill perry dick Moore. well not i don't think dick moore's was there yet i think it's just frank king and bill perry at the time and i, I actually loved them as like a duo because bill perry was a great cartoonist like people don't really give him a lot of credit so i have that and i have uh, a couple like uh you know like like somebody would write to frank king and say can i get a sketch and then he would send back a page so i have some of those yeah and i have the tear sheet you can't see it behind me it's like in the dark but it's the uh, Gasoline Alley, when they are walking through the woodcut. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can see it. Yeah, yeah, I've got that one framed on my wall. Some, some of the best comics ever made. It's so beautiful. And I grew up in the Midwest, so those those Sunday comics just remind me of the Midwest so much. You know, uh, yeah. area of Wisconsin, you know, right around my area of Minnesota where I grew up. Uh, How did you wind up in, in New Orleans? Um, short answer is, uh, I dropped out of college and hitchhiked down here to see Mardi Gras when I was, uh, 20 and, and kind of kept coming back. And then, uh, the most recent time I came back, I started as a, I'm a, I'm a creature of the alt weeklies like, uh, like you were. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, uh, so I started as editor of Gambit newspaper, which is the alt weekly here in New Orleans. Yeah. And, and that was in the late nineties. And. We started raising kids and and uh, stayed here. So I, I was as one of the people who just came down here because I wanted because the the lure of New Orleans uh, oh. was strong. What cartoonist did you hire? The Gambit. Oh, you know I I loved that part of Gambit actually. So I, I expanded all the cartoonists we were running. Um, you know we had uh, Matt Groening, we had Linda Berry, right. uh, we had the City, uh, we had uh, Tom the Dancing Bug. Um, we had Tom Tomorrow. We had a lot. Uh, yeah. But then, and we had some local cartoonists. Uh, one guy who passed away named Greg Peters uh, did a strip called Suspect Device. And some of the, um, a few of them were collected. And uh, who did that series? I'm blanking on it now. It was sort of the best of the alternative weekly press. It's called Attitude? Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, MBM. Put those out. Uh, there was a cartoonist that collected. Ted Rall did it. Yeah, Ted, yeah, Ted, yeah, Ted Rall. He, he put that together. So one of those has Greg Peters in there, but people could go online. It's amazing, amazing work. I loved working with him locally. And another local cartoonist named Bunny Matthews did some stuff for us. And um, I called up Harvey Picar and started, um, and one of the one of those alt-weekly editors has started a relationship with Mr. Picar. Wow. And, and he did a lot. They did that in Austin, too, I think. Uh, I think more than I did. But, yeah. but Harvey did. Harvey worked with Frank Stack and um, and a couple other cartoonists um, who's I've got Corona brain right now. Um, you know, the great the great cartoonist photojournalist that went to Palestine and went to uh, Sacco. Yeah. Yeah. Sacco did oh, one okay. for us. Um, Joe Sacco and. Uh, it was musician bio, so he did blues and New Orleans guys, or rhythm blues guys, and we ran those as cover stories. So oh. we, had, we had that. Uh, we had a bunch of those, and uh, that was really fun to do. Yeah, that was. I I really miss working in alternative weeklies because I I love that schedule. You know, like I built my week around Thursday. It was every Thursday for me. I had to turn in my new strip. Was Patty at the Westward? Patty Calvin? Yes. Was yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Patty. I adore Patty. She was, was tough. tough. But she, tough. I can imagine. I can imagine. We I knew her from, you know, editor drinking, you know, sessions, you know, at conventions and things like that. She but, was uh, me. She, she, that? she was the one who hired me because I would walk around Denver when I was just like a 
young man. I was like 20 years old and I was self-publishing my mini comics and I would go around town and drop the, drop off like stacks and all the boutiques and stuff for people to just take. Mm-hmm. And then I would stop and go down Broadway in Denver to the Westward office and I would give one to the lady at the front desk to give to Patty. And Patty would always read my comics. And then we started chatting over email. And then she forced my comic on the music editor who did not <laughs> want a comic strip in his section. And uh-huh. he did not like me. But he knew that like, he couldn't say anything about it because Patty wanted my strip in there. Pat, is she still is she still at the Westward? As far as I know, yeah. 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 The unsinkable Patty Calhoun. Uh, did you ever go to Monument Valley when you're like when you were in Arizona? So? Speaking of Frank King, you know, because he that's where he and Harriman uh, intersected as they both used to stay at the Weatherills in Cayenta. Uh, that's that those were Harriman's friends in Cayenta, Arizona, uh, right? Which is right, right outside of Monument Valley. And I never and, and actually uh, King did uh, one of the I guess John Weatherill was actually a character in some of his strips. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and there's some letters. The Weatherill family has, thank God, a grandson who's a real kind of family historian and had it saved all this, these letters that Harriman would send back and forth to this guy, Clyde Colville, who was sort of the postmaster and a friend of the uh, friend of the Weatherills. Uh, but I never found out if King and Harriman, they never, they, they seem to both be there, but never, I never found anything where they're really together. It's kind of odd because they, you know, were cartoonists during the same period. Um, yeah, I went, I went out there uh, twice three times during the nine years I was working on the book. Uh, the mm-hmm. first time was with my kid. Uh, I think he was seven at that time. And that was that was the big trip. That's when we rented a car and we went up to Page, Arizona um, and interviewed this woman um, who was, uh, she was a Navajo woman or Diné woman and she knew Harriman uh, and had great, great stories and great memories. Wow. Of, she remembered visiting Harriman in Hollywood and uh, and that she was there with the Weatherills, and they'd gone to visit him. And he greeted them at the door, this, that beautiful house up in the Hollywood Hills. And, and she described the whole thing beautifully and, and said, he, would, he, stand, he stood back, he opened the door, stretched out his arm and said, welcome to my abode. <laughs> that's like one of the most, that's like the most, and she kind of did, did his voice. And, and it is the, the most, almost the most sort of intimate memory of anybody I talked to the new Harriman, mm-hmm. almost, almost the most intimate memory that anybody shared is just that little detail that he kind of had this mock formality, uh, you know, when, when they entered and, and it, 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 it put me there almost more than any other specific uh-huh. memory of Harriman did. So I uh, visited her up in Page and then Monument Valley uh, in Cayenta. Um, there was another woman whose husband knew Harriman and she knew Harriman. But uh, she was also a Navajo woman, lived in Cayenta. And she said, oh, I got an envelope in the back, but she never could find it, um, uh-huh. where uh, Harriman had, had sent it. And it was like, a, she said it was a person in a puffy coat, you know, drawn on the outside of the envelope. But but the stories were really what I was caring about and said, you know, that Harriman would just love and sit and eat lamb stew and, and listen. And Harriman spoke multiple languages. And I'm pretty sure he probably had picked up, you know, at least some of the Navajo language uh, because Louise Weatherall, who was kind of his guide, uh, spoke fluent Navajo. Uh, and uh, so yeah, I got a real sense of Harriman and how much he loved that place. There's not a landscape like that anywhere. I mean, I got to say, you, once you hit Monument Valley, it is really mystical. These things really do look like the hands of God coming out of the out of the desert floor. I mean, it really is like, uh, um, and not just because they look like mittens, they just seem... Uh, I don't know, otherworldly. Um, it is, it is, you can, you can certainly see why Harriman's, why that captivated him and why he spent 30 years drawing, mm. you know, the landscape. Um, it's, it's really, uh, um, you know, he just looked out over the, the valley and all these characters just kind of sprung up like ghosts, you know, and he just started tracking their movements because um, you know, he was a deeply spiritual guy and that area talked to him uh, in a real specific way, I think. So it's it's beautiful to go out there. I recommend it. And and uh, the Goulding's Lodge is really fun to stay out. And then the Navajo built a, a a hotel right out in Monument Valley. You can stay at too. But I would want to go to Monument Valley when Harriman King and them were going because you would drive a Model T Ford through the desert with like what kind of road I can't even imagine. 
yeah. you know, just like whatever little crappy covering on the roof. And yeah. you're just out there and like all your belongings are strapped to the outside of the doors there. Just, I, I really want to experience that. That sounds like so much, such an adventure. No telephone poles or anything. One of my favorite interviews was this woman, Lola Roach, uh, who was the uh, grand niece of Hal Roach, the film producer, the Laurel and Hardy, oh, yeah. uh, our gang film producer and all the other, all the other Roach movies. Um, and Lola was the, um, uh, I guess just the niece, because I think she, yeah, she's just the niece. I think she's Jack Roach's daughter. Um, and Lola was actually an original Our Gang member. She had little blonde curls, oh. and uh, she was going to be an Our Gang, and, and then it didn't it, it didn't happen for some reason, but she was in a couple of the early ones. But uh, Jack Roach and Harriman were really good friends, and they went out to Arizona a couple times, and Lola and her sister Barbara went along with them one time. So she describe the journey you know she put me in the car uh, and said they had a block of ice oh, that, wow. like, like mounted out like as sort of a coolant they had some kind of little contraption a little I, I never actually looked this up to sort of follow up her memory and figure out if this was a common thing or not so i i, I don't know but i think there's like a metal bracket and you put a big block of you know of, of ice ice box ice yeah and, and then that would kind of bring some kind of cool air into the into the car um, and, uh, and they would sing and they, they sing the song ragtime cowboy Joe, like as they were driving along. And then she like sang the song for me. It was really wonderful. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And they stopped at the grand Canyon and they did have these little adventures, but she said also, uh, they stopped at the grand Canyon and got stuck there for about five or six days. Uh, and Harriman just went into a room basically. And I think he just had crippling migraines during that time. His granddaughter told about similar stories. Uh -huh. So uh, he, you know, he was also really in and out of bad health during that time too. But he went into a dark room and stayed there for a while and came back out and was, you know, back on the road again. Yeah. He, so what what was it like? I remember reading that he had like a some kind of kidney operation in the uh, 30s, I guess, or something. Yeah, he, he removed. Uh, that was one, yeah, one of the things that happened. Um, he had, um, you know, even as young, I think he was maybe tw 27 or so when he first started making jokes about rheumatism. Jesus. Um, you know, kind of, an, you know, kind of, a, you know, think of a, a 27 year old having, but it was very specific, you know, like there were two cartoons that, that he did and it's, you know, Harriman, what Harriman wants to do with rheumatism and he's like firing, you know, he's cocking a gun and old man rheumatism is, you know, sitting there ready to be, you know, shot down by Harriman. Uh, so, so he seemed to be in sort of bad health throughout his life. Uh, I get that sense. Um, and then by, by the thirties when he would have been, you know, as my age, uh, then, you know, I'm in my, you know, mid, mid to late fifties now, um, he would have had the kidney operation. He had crippling migraines. He had arthritis, uh, and he had uh, his granddaughter described uh, these really swollen legs with some kind of glass tubes. TMI for Harriman's healthier, maybe, but some uh -huh. kind of glass tubes were like sucking juices out. Uh, you know, like like he was. This would have been you know when he was again you know late 50s, 60 years old. You know, not that old, but it was really 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 bad health uh, during that time. In and out of the hospital. Oh my God! But uh, so you and you see that you see that in the strip. Besides the fact that kind of like with Charles Schultz, you see the physical limitation of Harriman's hand movements. You yeah, know, the way he draws the character. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also see there's some strips where where a Crazy Cat is in bed and the curtains are drawn and you know and it's just uh, uh, depressed. You know, I, I don't want to like diagnose Harriman, but uh, you know I think yeah. there was some depression there also. I remember I was visiting uh, his granddaughter one time in Tucson and I stayed and she let me stay in her guest room. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I slept, there was this oil painting of uh, Bobby Harriman, you know, Harriman's mother, you uh, know, ab above me, you know, <laughs> above the bed. Uh, and the artist actually described uh, the time she went and met George Harriman and said, you know, he was very sad. He had just lost his wife in a car crash. And, you know, said something like he was the saddest clown I ever met or something like that, you know. Um, so moments like that, I feel uh, 
emotionally connected to to Harriman. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly dreamed about him, uh, you know, and, and I felt inhabited by him, you know, a certain way after spending eight, nine years. I knew his family better than I know my family, you know, as far as the lineage and, and uh, stories about his grandfather and great grandfather. Um, but uh, I decided um, that if I was going to err, I was going to err on the side of playing it really conservative as far as interpreting what he was thinking or feeling or his motivations at any particular moment. You know, if I didn't have him writing about it or talking about it, uh, I wasn't going to speculate a whole lot. Mm. And I, the book was criticized for that sometimes. I think some people want to see more, especially in a modern biography, mm. I think people want more interpretation. Um, uh, I think I talked with Jeet here about that, actually. I think Jeet said, you know, people are going to want to see more interpretation and and uh i think he's right and and there's a there's an argument for that um but you know i was writing i, mean, I was writing across generations of time um uh, and i was writing across race uh and i was writing about a person that played his cards so close to his vest um and i wrote i was writing about you know i mean he uh i was writing about a guy who there were just all kinds of, of misinformation out uh, about even just nailing down the fact that he was from a you know free people of color family from New Orleans was was changing the, the narrative about him. So because it was all this kind of sketchy information out there, I kind of wanted a book that would um, be a foundation for other people's speculations, including myself. Like I've been writing about Harriman since then where I'm letting myself speculate a lot more about what he was up to and what his project was. And I felt in that book, I just wanted to kind of get the facts and try as hard as I could to create a narrative and to have a character live and breathe through the information that I really had. Um, so that was, that was, that's what, that was my goal. How long have people been talking about his race? I guess the first indication I have about his race is 1907, <laughs> 1906. Uh, you know, I think they were talking. I think my sense is that they were joking about his race. You mean, you mean, before, you mean after his death? Yeah. Well, I know, I know they were calling with the Greek, right, and everything like that. Joking about the Greek. You know, I mean, Tad Dorgan was the one who said that. He said, you know, they showed up and none of us knew what he was, so we called him the Greek. He came. You know, he looked like Omar. The, he looked like a cross between Nervy Nat and Omar the Tent Maker. Yeah. None of us knew what he. Was. So you know, it was basically he's saying, "Don't ask, don't tell." You know, he, we don't know what he was and we're not going to make a big deal of it. We're going to call him George the Greek because that was like it was all about the boxers, you know, during that time. So they all had nicknames like that, you mm -hmm. know, El the Turk or this or that, you know. So, you know, I think they just made a little nickname for him. And and, and but they they joked one time I found it's, this was a real eureka moment for me because, you know, I was going through I spent a couple of years just doing nothing but spooling through microfilm and uh and because you couldn't just read the comics because he had Beanie Walker, his close friend, had a column. And in that column, sometimes he would say George just showed up with tamales from his favorite stand and, you know, these little moments of the newsroom. And in one, uh, they talked about another mutual friend of theirs that that seemed to have been inspired by rubbing all the kinky witch threads out of George. No, rub, rubbing all the witch threads out of George's kinky locks. <laughs> Basically saying that this guy had gotten inspired by rubbing George Harriman's hair. It's an old folk myth, you know, about you get good luck by rubbing the person who works on your plantation as an enslaved person. You, you know, you rub their, his hair for good luck. That's like an old folk myth that you rub an African-American guy's hair. Uh -huh. uh, so that was a racial joke. They were like joking about Harriman's hair right there in print. So I'm like, I'm thinking that's going to be one one thousandth of the jokes they told in the newsroom. You know, that was just a thing they told. You know, that was just a joke that they, they had over and over again. And, and I think they probably were safe telling that joke because they knew nobody was going to do anything about that. You know, I mean, Harriman, you know, Harriman wasn't identifying outwardly, even mm -hmm. though in many ways his comics he did. But he wasn't identifying outwardly um, with uh, black life at that time, even during the you know Harlem Renaissance, which was, you know, going in full swing, you know, when he was drawing. And but um so that so that happened in his lifetime, um, and uh, then as far as the fifties and sixties, uh, there was a mention um, by Stanley Crouch 
that I thought was really interesting uh, in his essay he did for the Masters of American Comics mm -hmm. catalog uh, on Harriman, uh, when he said Ralph Ellison, that, that book right there. So he, he did a really blues for crazy cat. It was a really lovely, really nice essay he wrote. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and he said that Ralph Ellison was surprised when he heard the information in the early 70s that Harriman, uh, you know, was a person of color. Really? Uh, and, and so, so to, to Stanley Crouch, that suggested that not even in that half whispering world, you know, was there talk about, about Harriman as being an African-American cartoonist, you know, not even in Ralph Ellison's world. And Ralph Ellison paid really close attention to popular culture and would have been in that conversation if that, con you know, pretty likely would have been in that conversation if that conversation was taking place. Yeah. So when his his death certificate or his birth certificate came out or something, they they found out he was colored. Is that, is that yeah, what yeah, person of color. Uh, C right exactly it was a it, was, it said colored in parentheses. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was in the early seventies. Uh, there was a guy, uh, an academic in San Francisco, who was tasked with writing a, an entry for the Dictionary of American Biography. I think the book was, and he contacted the city hall in New Orleans. They said, yeah, here's his birth certificate. And he's like, looked like a, no, 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 that's not the right George Harriman. My guy's a white guy. Uh, and uh, and then the editor actually went back and said, you know, I think that might be him. Um, and uh, so he actually wrote a really good article about about that, about sort of how his own prejudices had blinded him to what was right in front of him. So, uh, you know, at that time there'd been scholarly work done calling him the, the son of Greek immigrants, um, <laughs> which which is completely understandable you know he was called george the greek and he talked about that harriman talked about that himself um in what way what did he say i think that harriman did the george i think he used the george the greek line himself i don't think he ever actually said my dad was greek um yeah. but everything he said about himself was has turned out to be historically questionable he did talk about his parents being bakers uh, you know, he said, I was the son of a baker. My dad said, you got to be a baker like me. But I baked a mouse into a loaf of bread and that, you know, got me thrown out of the job. You know, and that wasn't true. His dad was a tailor in you know, all of his life. That was just that was Harriman having having fun. Harriman played along with the gags, with George the Greek gags. Mm -hmm. But he never honestly and sort of candidly talked about his parents. Uh, except in one letter I found, he talked about his father dying. Um, and he made it really clear that he loved his dad a lot. It was a, it was a really uh, important relationship to him. That was very moving. Did his uh, dad stay in uh, New Orleans? No, his dad moved. Harriman was a kid, so his dad made the decision. You know, his dad was a, his dad and his grandfather were both really fierce political activists during a really revolutionary time in New Orleans history. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they signed a petition that a family friend gave to Abraham Lincoln for voting rights for Black voting rights. They were part of a, uh, they were friends with the first black owned daily news, the person who published the first black owned daily newspaper in the United States, uh -huh. which was in New Orleans. They uh, had tickets for political rallies at their tailor shop on Royal Street in the French Quarter. So they were very active socially and politically during this time, during Reconstruction. Um, but that slammed down pretty fast. And uh, once Jim Crow started ushering, being ushered in, that's when uh, a number of people who could choose the strategy of passing for white opted for that. And that's when his father moved Harriman, who was nine or 10 years old at that time, out to California with the rest of the family. So Harriman was nine or 10 when he landed in the frontier town of Los Angeles um, and was now a white person. Wow. Um, so that's another thing when you talk about interpreting, what did Harriman, what, what did the family talk about? How do they how do they talk about that with their kid? Right. Uh, that, that's a really profound question, I think. Yeah. And and you know how do they how do they present that information to Harriman? My my feeling is that Harriman brought that political activity into Crazy Cat, and, you know, and expanded it, um, and kind of created a world, a blueprint of a world where identity was fluid, uh, you know, where the he and she can be switched up and nobody really cares about it. Um, and where crazy cat can be an enigma mm -hmm. um, and, and, and has a perfectly fine place there in Coconino County where crazy cat can actually live as crazy cat.
you know, I think he kind of created this this vision of that place. Um, that's 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 that's, and I think it's connected. So I'm not going to interpret. You know, I don't think Harriman said, "Dad, I'm going to," you know, <laughs> I, but I, but I think it's connected to what Harriman grew up with as someone who had been a person of color in New Orleans, uh, uh-huh. and uh, probably later on, uh, it led to maybe his feeling of isolation, the fact that his whole lineage was left back in New Orleans, his grandparents, his cousins, you know, they were part of a real, their family basically owned the several blocks in the Treme neighborhood where he grew up. You know, they were a really connected family. Um, so you have to think that there was sort of, uh, you know, that uprooting must have had a psychological effect on the kids and, and you know, and the family. They were uh, Catholic? Yeah. Hmm. You know, Harriman married outside the Catholic church. Uh, she, he married a Protestant. Uh, so it was a mixed marriage in two ways. He, he married a white woman and he married a, a Protestant. And but she said that Harriman had to promise his parents that they would raise the kids Catholic, uh, you know, get them baptized and confirmed. Um, yeah. I never confirmed that, that they, the kids, their kids did go to Catholic church in, in Los Angeles. Um, the Catholic church archives in New Orleans was really friendly to me and the Los Angeles archives was not. Uh, the archdiocese in, in Los Angeles wouldn't open up their records to me. They said that was personal information, and I couldn't couldn't see baptism records from 1906 what? or something. <laughs> so, so I never confirmed. Sort of, I really wanted to know because that would be interesting to know. Did they bring their baby to be confirmed, and you know, bring their child? You know, but I, I, it looked like they did. It looked like they, had, you know, raised their kids, you know, Catholic. Um, yeah. And then Harriman's parents, uh, and also Harriman's sister, were were buried in Catholic cemeteries. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, but Harriman and his wife were not, they were both cremated and had their ashes spread. Did he have a good marriage? You think that was, um, the sharpest criticism I got actually was, um, from a reviewer in the wall street journal, uh, basically for not writing a lot about the marriage. Um, and I did mention, I did say in the book. There is no information. I should have probably said in really big letters, <laughs> there's not going to be a lot about the marriage here uh, because there just was not information about it. Um, there was speculation. Um, there were stories that D. Harriman's granddaughter had. Um, but Harriman's granddaughter's mother, Bobby, died when D. was very young. And everything she got was from a friend of Bobby's. So it was really filtered through, you know, through time and through different personalities. Uh, and I couldn't talk to Bobby's friend to find out anything, you know, from her. So because she had passed away, too. So I, I do know that Harriman and his wife were separated a lot. Harriman went back and forth in his late 30s and 40s. He was going back and forth between Los Angeles and New York quite a bit. And uh, and his wife stayed in in uh, in Los Angeles. So there was a lot of physical separation there and they weren't Skyping like we were now. So yeah. it was you know, pretty serious. There was a family story that um, that Mabel, his wife, had fallen in love with uh, and was going to leave Harriman. Um, I did not choose to include that story because, again, this came. I was like three separations away from, from the story. I could talk about it here casually, but yeah, yeah. you know, it, it was, it was a, a single source family story and I just didn't know. Um, yeah. So the, but the, the daughters supposedly had talked Mabel out of running away with a, a cowboy from a dude ranch. And it was around that time that Mabel got into a car accident and was killed instantly. The only thing I found Kind of like that one single document I found about the friends making jokes about Harriman's race. Mm-hmm. The only document I really found about George and Mabel's marriage was uh, after Mabel died. It was called Kitty, by the way. That was her nickname was Kitty. That after after she died, uh, Bobby, uh, Harriman's daughter, who he adored. I mean, yeah. Bobby and George were they were really tight. And, and just like him, by the way. <laughs> right. She looked just like him. 
Didn't she though? Yeah. And 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 she was an artist, and uh, she loved Arizona, and she was friends with his friends, and they were just their 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 you know their father daughter relationship was is very very moving. So Bobby was going to have a party. I think it was an anniversary party. He, she had gotten married to Ernest Pascal, and he was contacting his friends in in Arizona. He had to stay home, and was saying, you know, I want you to throw a big party. Uh, for Bobby, you know, he sent some money along. He gave suggestions about what kind of food to get. He was being very, very specific about the party, but throw a big surprise party uh, and said, uh, this was Kitty's idea. She tells me things sometimes, referring to his dead wife. Have you heard his voice before? Is there any recordings? No, you know, I told I told you that I, uh, I, I would dream about Harriman sometimes. Mm-hmm. I had this one dream where I dreamt I was, this is, saying, no, I never actually heard his voice. But I had this dream where I, I was talking to George Harriman. This is when I was in the middle of work on the book and said, I found out your birthday. And Harriman laughed and said, you did, huh? You know, like, basically like the simplest facts are going to, you know, are going to uh, be elusive. Um, and I realized the voice that I heard in the dream was actually uh, the woman who was doing the imitation of George Harriman, Welcome to My Abad. She had a real husky, deep voice, you know, the... the yeah. non- that I met up on page. It was, I was really kind of hearing her voice imitating George Harriman. And that's kind of the closest I've ever come to hearing Harriman's voice was hearing Betty uh, Rogers, uh, you know, do this little imitation of him. No, you know, I mean, it, by the time the radio was coming around and you might have expected to have an interview, maybe, uh, you know, he wasn't that big anymore. You know, by the 30s, uh, you know, he really wasn't a, 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 big, a big thing like Rube Goldberg. Or you know, or some of these other cartoonists uh, at that time, who's you know, who we can, and who lived much longer too. So no, uh, and there's only uh, one piece of film of him actually moving through space as well. Uh, and there's another one that that's a home movie that I have. Yeah, you uh, showed that in, in Columbus when I yeah. went to your talk. Yeah, it was very moving at the end of the of all the information that you learn to then actually see him. I remember. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house that night when you did that presentation. You know, it was, it was pretty incredible. I mean, he just seemed like uh, he, he my uh, interpretation of him is that he was just a really good man. You know, he was just a good guy and probably yeah. introverted like most cartoonists I know. You know, when you're when you're talking to somebody who is uh, who, you know, is has read more books than you. Mm-hmm. Uh, who you think is probably a better artist than you are, you mm-hmm. know, um, and uh, you know you just admire the hell out of, and they're also like legitimately humble. Mm-hmm. How you're just drawn to that person? Yeah, you know, that's the feeling I get when I when I hear their Harriman's friends talk about him, like after Harriman died at different times. Uh, that's that's that's. I think if anything, they were a little annoyed that he had this uh, big inferiority complex, uh, that he was so kind of down on himself in a certain kind of way. I think that was probably the closest thing to, um, you know, that job interview, name, name your biggest character flaw, you know, oh, yeah. uh-huh. that's, that's probably, you know, too, too self-effacing would probably be the, the only one that could, you know, fill out on the George Harriman form. Um, yeah. that his friends would talk about that, you know, just like, you know, that he, he would say, Oh, I can't go painting. I don't have any talent for that. And his friends were like, you know, um, what was it? Uh, was it E.E. E. Cummings who like started writing about uh, George Harriman? Yeah, he right after Harriman died. Uh, well, Cummings, when he was in college at Harvard, he he put Crazy Cat strips up on his dorm wall. Wow. Uh, he was a fan from long back, and uh, then after Harriman died, Cummings had a name at that point, and he contacted his publisher and said, "You know, I don't want there to be uh, you know uh, a total absence of Crazy Cat strips now. Can, I want to put a book together." And I think really on Cummings' name, not on Harriman's name. And you know, Cummings said, "I'll write the introduction." And uh, so I think that's that's how that first book got published. And really, that was the only book for through the fifties. I mean, that was the one. That was the one Charles Schultz saw. You know, that was his first introduction to Crazy Cat when he saw you know when he saw that book after coming home from the war. But uh, you know, Gene Deitch died, and I went on Amazon Prime and I was looking up Gene Deitch animations to watch in honor. And- yeah all the crazy cat uh cartoons on there that is so weird i don't know why that claim that claymation one is the closest one but even with that they had to have the stupid narration yeah it's like i don't know why they could not 
they could not capture like what Crazy Cat was in animation because then the other the black and white ones which are basically like old Felix the Cat mm-hmm. or something like man why do they why do they do this like what <laughs> for me the closest ones are the very very first uh, what was what was her film studio called I forgot but those first ones in six, 1916 1917 where it basically took the daily strips and <laughs> and it was and you didn't I think one of the things is you don't have a voice. Yeah. You don't have this gender problem. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do about how do you how, how do you how do you do that with a voice? How do how, you know if Crazy is both because Crazy switches effortlessly back and forth. You know, Herman's playing with the pronouns. Mm-hmm. Crazy says, "I may be taking a wife. No, maybe I'll take a husband." You know, and how how does that work unless you're going to do a really experimental? People back then, like newspaper readers, must have been getting so angry reading a strip like that. Like, what is this? What does this yeah. mean? Is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know, the color changes were a little more understandable. They're kind of, you know, Crazy Cat would change colors. Um, it would be almost a little bit like a Hal Roach comedy where, you know, someone, you know, falls into, uh, you know, into the mud and they think he's a black man or you yeah. get a flower goes over and thinks he's a white man. Yeah. You know, that, that, those kind of gags a little more. But the gender mm-hmm. thing just went back and forth. Uh, and that was a Frank Capra when he when he met Harriman. That's the thing he said. What's going on? And then there was another uh, editor. Well, I mean, that's I think why newspaper readers would write these letters saying, you know, drop the strip. You know, this, this thing's driving me crazy. <laughs> you know, crazy with a C. Um, Gene Deitch uh, talked about that. Uh, he saw that, but he he said he felt like Harriman. He said basically they had to make Harriman. I mean, Crazy Cat a. Uh, a girl because you couldn't have anything that was suggesting a gay relationship. Um, yeah. So they had to give Crazy Cat this squeaky little girl voice. And, um, and you know, I talked about having a dream about Harriman. Gene Deitch said he felt like Harriman was over his shoulders, like scolding him the entire time he was doing those comics. So, you know, Deitch obviously knew what Harriman's comic felt like and knew that he wasn't, you know, creating that on the Saturday morning cartoons there. But I did a, a, a new essay for a new Fanagraphics volume. Mm-hmm. And it's actually it was actually about Crazy Cat and race, and kind of really trying to spell out all the ways, even more than in the book, all the ways that Crazy Cat uh, communicated ideas of race in the strip. Um, and I, there's another essay that I want to write about Crazy Cat that I've just been thinking a lot about, which is actually it came from writing like a Twitter thread uh, about that strip where Bobby when Bobby Herman dies and and mm-hmm. Crazy Cat sees a falling star and and sends it back up to the heavens. Um, I, I realize there's a lot of death in Crazy Cat, like a lot of, um, you know, not where like characters die, yeah. but just a lot of meditations on death. Mm. Not unique in, in early comics. Um, a lot of I- ideas about, so I actually want to write like a death comes for Crazy Cat, you know, kind of, uh, yeah. kind of essay and kind of look at this. Cause you know, just like, during that time after World War I, when spiritualism became a big fad in the United States because people were confronted with death of their loved ones all around them. I feel like we're in that time now where, yeah. Uh, and I think Crazy Cat has something to say about that. Did you see the essay in the, well, I'm sure you did, in McSweeney's, the comics issue, where it's just the last Crazy Cat strips yeah. that were left on his drawing board? Yeah, yeah, that that Chris Ware, Chris Ware and Tim Samuelson mm-hmm. owned. Uh, in fact, they, when I went to uh, Chicago and did an event, they showed up and brought those strips. Yeah, I, I don't know a lot of people would actually like cart them in, but they they were displayed at the bookstores. Wondering, it was very sweet and generous of them, and it was very fun. Um, yeah, well, that and also just uh, um, yeah, because that has Crazy Cat kind of playing the banjo and and you know yeah. singing the song. But then those last Sunday pages uh, where when Crazy dies, when Crazy Cat dies. Um, Bud Sagendorf, the guy that took over Popeye, Popeye, yeah, yeah. Um, or worked worked with Cigar and Popeye. Mm-hmm. Um, he was at King Features during that time, and uh, I've been I have a taped interview with him talking about when that strip showed up, uh, and it was after Harriman died. Wow! And, and uh, you know Russell Myers, the guy that did, does uh, he's still active, uh, does Broomhilda. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he did this taped interview with. Sagendorf, um, and I saw a notice of it in somebody else's archives, 
so I contacted him and he ran me off a copy and sent it to me. So it was really sweet. So I got to listen to the interview between Sagendorf uh, and Myers. And it was like a cassette tape from, you know, 30 years ago. Or oh, more. That's, oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and but he, he describes it. And they really focus on Harriman. Um, they talk about Harriman a lot uh, and Seagar and Harriman. And uh, but they just describe when that when that strip showed up showing Crazy Cat dying after Harriman had already died. And they just sat and looked at it, uh, you know, stunned, uh, you know, that this had, this had happened in, in, in Crazy Cat. Wow. So that'd be part of the, the story, too. So the you finished your essay for the um, Fanographics republishing of the Crazy Cat? Yeah, they're reissuing their their they're doing new hardback volumes. You know, some of those are out of print. Uh, they're Sunday pages, so uh, they're adding some new things. So I've done a couple new uh, essays for them, and I don't seem to get tired of writing about this. It, I, I don't mind. You know, I guess it's like when you're a Bible scholar. Uh huh. Like there's there's always new things to say. Uh, <laughs> so as long as I can think of something new to say, and this one is actually kind of. It, I, it, it's going over um, some, you know, I certainly talk about race, but again, I, I, in, in the book, but I, I feel like I can, in an essay, I let my voice come out a little more and be a little more speculative and a little more, you know, imagining what Harriman saw when he saw a minstrel show. Yeah. You know, what spoke to him and, and his, his decision to turn that kind of inside out, uh, you know, in Crazy Cat. Um, and play with that a little bit more. Hey, this is one more book I want to show you and see if you have any, if you know it. Mm -hmm. You have this? N no, I've seen that book. I don't have that. McCutcheon from Chicago, right? Oh yeah. Are you a fan of McCutcheon or not? You know, I I've liked what I've seen. I've never done a deep dive into McCutcheon. I, that's a that's a fault. Well, he wrote his own memoir and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's he was, it's not a lot about cartooning in there. Like, you know, you would think he would talk about uh, hanging out in the Chicago building with all those cool guys. But it's mostly about the fun adventures he went on. And, and like, I think he owned an island and stuff. He, he was uh, one of those guys who wrote like, like a Hemingway type of guy, really, really manly. So it's a lot of that kind of stuff. I did scan that memoir uh, in the, is there anything here for me? <laughs> George Harriman years, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, all these newspaper guys, Journalists too did all. I mean, there were so many 1900, 1910 newsman memoir books. I, you know, love that. I love that stuff. Yeah, and it's it. Oh, so do I. I I, I got lost in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Seriously lost in it. Yeah, um, I'll show you my signature from the one time we met. I, wrote, I really loved reading your Eugene Debs book. Excuse me. The oh, there's in Columbus. Yep. And that was yeah yeah yeah. That's what I did. That was really fun to, to be there. Yeah, that was great. All right, I look forward to seeing you in New Orleans, Noah. Yeah.